Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back for another weekly market recap with my good friend Lance Roberts. Hey, Lance, happy to see you at the end of the week here. Yeah, no, we made made it through another week. <laughs> made it through another week, and you know, I got to imagine this week wasn't as bananas as many of the ones you've had recently. So hopefully, you got a chance to just catch your breath a little bit. No, it, um, it was it was about, it was about as bad as it's been lately. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, look, markets were relatively range bound. Uh, yeah. This week, um, interesting Friday end of the, had a very interesting end of the week with some of the things going on, um, both in terms of you know Fed leak and stuff that the bank yeah. uh, you know, emergency measures the Bank of Japan suddenly having to do. So it got a little bit crazy right here at the end. Um, but why don't you tell us uh, what 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 drove the action this week for you? So it was interesting. Um, so we were actually looking at the you know. So every week when we have our investment committee meeting, you know, we sit down and we analyze returns for the, our benchmarks, the market, our portfolios, et cetera. And it was interesting because with all the volatility since, uh, go back to October the 1st, we come out of the gate, two big up days. Then we fall to new lows with a CPI report. And then when we hit the new lows on the CPI report, then we rock it back up five and a half percent. We rally for a couple of days and sell off after that. And so with all that volatility, you know, we were actually up yesterday. So at the close of the business on Thursday, we were up 0.7% for the month. Um, with all that volatility, it's like, it's, and, and, you know, you're kind of looking at it going, that doesn't seem right because it seems so bad. It seemed like there was a lot of selling, you know, all of this whole month has just been, you know, just sell day after sell day, but it really wasn't the case. You've had these big, strong up days that have kept the index kind of positively biased. And, so, you know, this is this is that kind of, as we talked about before, that's how bear markets work. You know, they just kind of grind on you and grind on you. It's like, man, you know, everything I do, it doesn't work and nothing's working. And, you know, it's just that kind of market. And, and that's the that's kind of where we were going into Friday. And then on Friday, of course, you know, if we started out lower in the mornings, you know, we were looking at the futures Friday morning and we were going to break back below the 20 day moving average. So that would set the market up to retest the lows that we set earlier in the month. So that wasn't good. And then we had a couple of things come out, which was the Bank of Japan intervening in the currency market. That's a lost cause. They've done this. They've done this three other times before. You get this. You get this. You know, Japanese yen dollar trade that helps boost stocks short term, but that fails like the next day because the, Japan's got to choose between either yield curve control or bailing out their dollar. They can't have both. So, you know, what, go ahead. Nope, no, it's not in a violent agreement. Okay, <laughs> so they're going to have to choose. And, and whatever, whichever one they choose, it's not good for them. The, you know, Japan is fine, you know, for a long, for years now, um, you know, the last 12 years at least, it's, it's been a common theme that Japan was a bug in search of a windshield. Well, they finally found the windshield. So now they're in a really bad position. Then, of course, uh, what really got the market going on Friday was Nick Timoros, who writes for the Wall Street Journal. He is the golden child for the Federal Reserve. He's kind of their mouthpiece, making some overtures that very likely the Fed is going to start to slow their pace of rate hikes coming into December. Right now, futures were pointing at about a 75 basis point rate hike for November and December. And the commentary this morning from the Wall Street Journal was is that, that the Fed will start to try to talk that back to 50 basis points in December, trying to start to slow the pace of rate hikes. Of course, the Fed's walking a very fine line here, which is how long do I rate sending them running through the roof and creating more inflation? So it's a really fine balancing act that the Fed's got to work with, and we'll see how they how they handle this. Because now remember. Coming up, we've got November 2nd, 3rd is the Fed meeting. November 8th, which is the following Tuesday, is midterm elections. So over the next three weeks, we've got a lot of stuff going on with the market. All right. Um, okay. So you, you just talked about the elections. Um, uh, I guess first question is, is uh, I'm sure the Fed is feeling some pressure from the administration right now, which is just say, do what you can to just make things look as good as you can until the elections happen. Um, and I would say the Fed hadn't been helping the administration all that much the past couple of months. I mean, it's 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 things have been pretty grim from 
people's personal feelings about the economy. Um, so uh, maybe that's some of the reason why the Fed was jawboning this morning. Who knows? Um, do you expect after the election there to be kind of like a, all right, we don't have to prop it up anymore. I mean, do you expect sort of like a cleansing of, of, of bad yeah. news coming out or, or, or yeah. important decisions that move the markets down afterwards? Well, I think what you're going to see more of is a lot of this really good economic data that we've been having lately. We'll see all that get revised. And we'll, we'll see, you know, as we get into 2023, we'll start getting revisions to jobless claims and housing and unemployment roles and all this there'll be sharply negative revisions and, and things will be, things are, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out right now that, that things on the ground, if you just talk to your neighbor, talk to your friends, talk to your relatives, you know, everybody's just trying to figure out how to make ends meet and get by. And, and that's certainly not conducive to the strong type of economic growth numbers that we've been talking about lately. On the unemployment side, CEO confidence is at record level, you know, pushing record lows in terms of their confidence. CapEx is dropping sharply. And, you know, but yet we have this robust hiring that's going on every month. And, and that, and, and look at small business reports as well. You know, their, their views aren't that great on hiring either. Uh, you know, a lot of CEOs talking about hiring freezes, not hiring workers. Maybe we haven't laid off workers, but some of these strong employment reports certainly are a little bit suspect considering some of the anecdotal data. Now, maybe it's, maybe it's I'm completely wrong. And maybe that data is right on tack, but we've seen post-election cycles before how you get big negative revisions to data. Right, right. You 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 kind of the window dressing stops, or they they yeah. remove the lipstick from the pig, however you want to call it. But okay, exactly. and that's not <laughs> look look. It's not conspiracy theory. All we know is that historically, post-elections, we see negative revisions to data. So yeah. that's all I'm yeah. saying. I'm not I'm not trying to make some it's it's election fraud, right? No. It's not that. It's just this is what we've seen historically. Right, right. And I mean, we've all lived through enough political cycles to know that that yeah. they do everything they can to to you know drum up as much rosiness as they can while people are walking into the election booth. So wouldn't wouldn't be a surprise. Um, so are you also concerned that um, a couple couple of weeks back you had said, "Hey, look, uh, markets were really oversold. Um, you weren't surprised by the violent." bounce that we had off of the the day low of the um the CPI release um that, that very violent one I think it was like the third biggest reversal in, in market history um but if I remember correctly I think you said um the, the danger here for the market is that it kind of goes sideways for a while and it starts burning off the oversold uh degree yep. because the past, but definitely this week, and maybe even part of last week into this week, the, the market really hasn't, when you look at the beginning and the end, it hasn't really gone all that far. It's pretty range bound. Are you concerned that we might be burning off that oversold condition? Uh, yeah, I am actually, because, you know, part of, you know, what you want for a, a good follow through rally is the markets to come off a deeply oversold level, and then you get buyers really excited and they start coming in. Well, those oversold conditions in the market are the fuel, so to speak, for the engine to work. And when we, you kind of just trend sideways, you burn off a lot of the, the buyers that are going to come in. They, they come in to buy because they're trying to buy the bottom. But then they keep getting met with sellers and you kind of just burn up the capital that was going to be put to work you know, in stocks. Now, we haven't done that fully yet. We've done a little bit on a real short term basis. But there's actually been some pretty good positive technical developments. And I'm going to have this in this weekend's newsletter. So if you go to our website, realinvestmentadvice.com, um, I'm talking about a couple of things this weekend. Uh, the first is, is that we bounced right off the 200-week moving average. So that bullish trend support that we've had going back to 2009 held, at least at this point. So that was that's positive from that set standpoint. Um, the other thing was, is that as the markets were making new lows and, and as we <clears throat> got that CPI report, markets broke down to new lows and then reflexed off of that. Prior to that, actually, the, the, the moving average convergence divergence indicator that's called the MACD for slang and also the relative strength index RSI. Those both of those indicators, which were oversold, actually started 
rising before the market. While the market was making new lows, they were actually turning up. And that's what we call a positive divergence. And so that positive divergence is actually a fairly decent sign. And we can put on top of that, that despite that sell-off in the market on the CPI report, volatility actually went down that day. So we haven't seen volatility spiking. That's a good sign. We've got this positive divergence in technical indicators. That's bullish. And you kind of got some price action here that's starting to improve. We went above the 20-day moving average. That's been the trend line resistance you know, during this entire decline since the August peak. We got above that. And now there's kind of a clear, uh, and then we came back down and retested it. And then Friday bounced off of that fairly sharply. So now we've got this kind of setup here that's a little bit bullish and kind of is an open window to about 3,900 on the S&P. If we can get to that point, that's where the 50, 100 day moving averages are sitting right on top of each other. I would sell some there. And then if we get above that, your next target's 4,400, where the 200 day moving average is, I would sell a lot there. Okay. Um, and, and on that point, uh, you know, we, we have the election coming up. One thing's markets like is for uncertainty to be removed, right? So we'll at least know what the results of the elections are. Um, it probably okay. highly likely will be at least a gridlocked Congress, which markets tend to like too, right? Um, just means the rules aren't going to change probably for a while, which markets like. Um, and then third, um, we are beginning to approach the end of the year. And historically, you know, you sort of have the Santa Claus rally. Um, do you think there could be one this year? I mean, it's been a crazy year. Yeah. Um, a lot of people might think, ah, it's Tepe or Santa's going to skip. But a lot of people might say, no, there's been a lot of pain this year. You know, and that increases the odds for a better end of the year. Um, no. I'd yeah. ask you to predict what's going to happen. But but is there is there a decent enough chance one could happen that we should be yeah. keeping an eye out for the probability? Well, so, so first of all, you know, Santa Claus, what is Santa Claus rally, right? So, you know, that's the, it, it sounds so Christmassy, right? Right. <laughs> All that is, is, you know, right at the end of the year. So, so two things happen in December. And in a normal year, and I'm going to say this is not a normal year because we've had so much selling already. We've had more negative days this year than any other market year. You have to go back to 1974 to find a year with more days. And we may actually surpass that um, this year. We'll see when we get to the end of the year. Um, but we've had a lot of selling this year. So mutual funds, hedge funds, pension funds, they're all holding a lot of cash right now that they've got to get invested by the end of the year. Now, normally, so let's back up for a second. So normally, there's two things you can kind of count on in December, that as you're going into December, you always want to sell right after Thanksgiving, take some profits right after Thanksgiving, because going into the first two weeks of December, all the mutual funds have to distribute capital gains, interest, and dividends. And so you get the selling pressure in the market. So generally, you can almost always count on a bit of a correction in the market. Now, I'm not talking about a lot, but the markets will go down 2 3%, something like that. And so you tend to get this little bit of a pullback in the market ahead of Christmas. Coming out of Christmas, all these mutual fund managers want to have their books. Well, they got to do two things. One, a lot of mutual funds have a, have a kind of a mandate that they can only hold so much cash on their books at any one time. So, uh, for, you know, when, so it comes into the year, if their mandate says you, can, you can't have more than 5% cash, they got to invest the difference. And so that's why you get that buying at the, year, at the year end, because you've got window dressing for that year end reporting. Everybody's got to issue out all their statements. They want to make sure they have all the right stocks on their, on, on their balance sheet, right? Now, they may buy it December 31st, but it's on the balance sheet when it comes out. So you go, oh yeah, my mutual funds owned Apple, great. Um, so that's why normally you get that Santa Claus rally. It's just that window dress and going into the end of the year and getting ready for the new year. Now, that also goes for the first five days of January. Everybody's like, well, first five days are always good. That's because everybody's putting their assets on the books for the year. So that's the other, the, the other side. So you got these kind of two bullish actions. All right, yeah. great. I, I really appreciate you breaking all that down for us. And, and we'll revisit this, folks, as we get closer to these periods, because um, I'm sure Lance will have yeah. where those capital flows may go. But basically, you're okay. saying that the, you're going to see the markets raise near the end because of this forced buying where they've just got to get cash off the books. And then you probably want to look like you're saying at you know, whatever stocks are in favor at that point in time, because that's what people are doing for the window dressing. They want to show, okay, I've got the good stocks in my portfolio, right? So yeah. let's say Apple is one of the ones that have been least hit all year. You probably want to be in there, right? Yeah. 
So, so, but we've got a couple of things. So having said that, right. So that's the normal, yep. year. this is not normal, right? So we've had, like I said, we have a lot of selling this year. You've got record levels of cash sitting on the books of these portfolio managers. And so they've got to get that cash put to work. So we've got starting at the end of next week. So when we get through next week, um, we will have 70% of the S&P 500 companies will have reported by next week. That's important because that opens up the stock buyback window. So all these corporations that are reporting earnings, they can't buy back stock right now. They're in what we call the blackout period. Come October 28th, that window opens up. And so all these S&P 500 companies, as they start to wrap up reporting, can go back to buying back shares. That's going to be about $4.5 billion a day going through the end of the year wow. in some buybacks. Then, again, so you take that plus this record level of cash that's sitting on the balance sheet of these hedge funds, pension funds, your mutual funds, et cetera, that has to get put back to work. There's a really good potential here that we could see a fairly strong end of the year rally. And again, that's why I'm saying, you know, 4,400 is a, is a reasonable target for this kind of year end rally. I would sell into it. It's not the beginning of the new bull market. That's what you'll hear on television. It's not. Because next year, all these rate hikes the Fed has done is going to play catch up in January, February, March, April, May, June. And that's where those interest rate hikes are going to collide with weak economic growth. And we'll have a repricing. We'll have an earnings recession and stocks will have to reprice for an earnings recession starting next year. OK, um, I'm really glad we started on this topic because I think that that's a really key thing to underscore for people, which is as pessimistic, bearish, whatever you might be about the market's prospects here in the, the mid to longer run. I think Lance, you're, you're raising a very credible um, potential that we might see a bullish rally updraft as a result from all these things you've talked about, you know, buybacks, uh, the window dressing for the end of the year, all that type of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the key things about investing is, is, you can't just have your end thesis be right. You have to chart a path to get from where you are to where you're going to be. Uh, if you just do it mindlessly, you can get killed along the way if things go in a way that you don't expect. So, um, you know, Lance is very clearly saying we don't know exactly what's going to happen. But I think you're saying, Lance, this is a probability that you yeah. should definitely be prepared for the potential of it happening because there's a fair amount yeah. of, of capital that's going to flood into the markets relatively soon. Yeah. And, and again, you know, look, does that mean it has happened that way? No. I mean, you know, look, we've got a risk here. And to your point, there's there's a, a real risk that the Fed breaks something. Um, look, we're you know, we're seeing the Fed sending, you know, cash reserves to switch you know, to, to Swiss Bank. And, um, you know, we've had what's going on with UK and the pension funds there. We got what's going on with Bank of Japan. You know, there's things that are starting to break. And I mean, we could literally wake up one morning and this market be down you know, four or five, 600 points in, in a morning because something broke overnight. And, and, and the question is simply, you know, we can't and, and we shouldn't avoid, you know, dis disregard that risk entirely. All I'm saying is, is that we've got a very deeply oversold market. You know, we've got a lot of cash on the sidelines. We, we Earnings are not as bad as expected. Now, it's not great news. That was going to be my next question. So I'll pine on this just for a second. So Earnings yeah. have not been as bad as we thought, right? Right, right. And, and so that's, but that's not saying they're good either. Right? It's not saying they're good, yeah. <laughs> There's not as bad. Um, so there, that's providing some of that lift. And so, you know, all I'm saying is that there's a real possibility, uh, again, of a rally, you know, back towards that 200 day moving average, kind of like we saw back in July and August. You know, you have to go back to June. And in June, everybody felt exactly the same way. We're talking about you and I were talking about, I said, I said, and I said, all we need is a rally here that gets Jim Cramer to come out and say the bottom of the market is in exactly what he did. And, you know, we got to the 200 day moving average and it was all over. Um, you know, but we're back to that. Right. I mean, we're back to that same super, you know, uh, the, the, uh, I run a composite index of, of investor sentiment. It's at some of the lowest levels again since 2008. Our fear greed index is over in the, the extreme fear section. So. You know, everywhere you look, the markets are just in a position that you just need, you know, you just kind of exhausted sellers. And it, and it doesn't take much buying when you when you've got an exhaustion of sellers, it doesn't take a lot of buying at all to move the markets fairly substantially. 
All right. And, and, and this is, again, folks, why this is such a challenging year for investors yes. is, you know, there's, you <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of shoulds. There's a lot of things that should be happening right now. Um, but then there's a lot of things that Lance is talking about, these sort of cross currents that can take the action in a totally different direction, you know, for a material period of time. And so you got to be, you know, you, you can't have an all in one allocation. Uh, you can't just sort of set it and forget it. You got to be watching the tape and uh, you've got to be nimble and diversified. So we'll get more into this. Um, so uh, another thing that that's just been catching my attention a lot recently, and you now were talking about this a little bit before we turned the camera on here, Lance, is uh, treasury yields are are getting crazy right now. Um, uh, I, I actually haven't even looked today, uh, but the one-year treasury yield is over four point four and a half percent, right? Um, and what, what are what are uh, thirty years yielding right now? Like a little over four. Yeah. I mean, the, the curve is is pretty inverted here, right? Oh, extremely. Yeah. Yeah. So you can get now. You know, again, it's not beating inflation. Inflation, um, but it's getting closer. Um, you can get a pretty good return in a pretty darn safe instrument these days, um, and. Uh, uh, you know, this morning before we had the, the the Fed leak, I mean, rates were shooting up again. So I'm just curious. You know, in in, in one sense, as a capital manager, you've got to be saying, "Oh, all right, well, you know, so some of these bonds are becoming more interesting." You know, a because they're yielding a decent yield, and B because if I do think there's a Fed pause or Fed pivot or something in the future, um, you know, they they then may appreciate. Uh, from a face value standpoint uh, or market value standpoint, you know, materially, right? On the other hand, you got to be saying, oh my God, these these yields are getting so high, something's going to break. The economy can't stand interest rates this high. So I'm just curious, how are you looking at this? So a couple of ways. One is, is that, you know, you know, it's like we always talk about investors do the wrong thing at the wrong times every time, right? If they're so driven by emotions, yes. Yeah, which and, many and are. Is. And so right now, you know, we're you know, I'm getting tons of emails from people like saying, "Oh yeah, I, I just went and bought, you know, I just put my whole account in two year treasuries. I'm getting four percent. I'm good." That sounds great, fine and dandy, but that type of action is, you know, we're we're going to get to the bottom of this market. Maybe it's maybe it was this month. Um, October's historically more often than not mark the lows for markets. I'm not saying that this was the low. I'm just saying historically. Um, maybe it's next year. Maybe it's early next year. Maybe it's mid next year. Who knows? Now, but the issue is going to be that at some point, this market's going to bottom and stocks are going to start to rally fairly sharply. And the problem is, is that all these people that went out and sunk all their money in 4% treasuries are now going to try to figure out how to get back into the stock market again, right? because that's where the return's going to be. So you can almost guarantee that when you see a mass migration of people starting to buy you to your treasuries, that that trade is probably almost over. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're to that, we're getting to that point, but, you know, from a portfolio management perspective, you know, you've got a lot of things that are going on that are drive, driving yields lower. And, and Michael Leibowitz has a really good article coming out. We're going to, we're going to have a snippet of it in tomorrow's daily commentary. Um, sorry, on Monday's daily commentary on our website that we publish every day. Um, but talking about mortgage backed bonds and how the creators of mortgage backed bonds have to hedge that risk and they hedge that risk with, with treasuries. And so when they're trying to hedge the differentials between mortgage bonds and treasuries, there's an arbitrage that goes on and they wind up having to sell treasuries, which has been putting a lot of downward pressure on treasury bond prices. That's just one aspect of stuff that's happening. Because if you actually take a look at foreign inflows into treasuries, what you would expect, you've actually had a good bit of foreign money coming in. You've had foreign buying coming into long dated treasuries because they're, they're moving money into the US dollar as reserve currency and to hedge off their currency risk as our dollar goes up and gets stronger, their, their currency is going down. So actually foreigners are, are doing a lot of buying of treasuries here. We just had more net selling at this point, but that's about to end. And, and so we're about to get to that point where you're about to get a fairly sharp reversion in yields and bond prices, and that'll, that'll come corresponding with, um, you know, the Fed realizing that they've broken something. But in the next few months, you know, you're going to see a pretty sharp reversion. I, I've made a personal bet on this in my own trading account. So we'll, we'll at the end of next year, we'll talk about how well it worked out or not. <laughs> All right. Well, look. Um, so uh, you know. 
again, lots of opportunities here. People can keep people can put capital to work right now in some of these instruments and get a decent return. I think Lance is saying, be careful not to go too far out because you might miss the party being locked up in this stuff. Um, real quick, and I ask this for the general viewer, but but also to be honest for myself too. Um, I have recently bought um, some treasury bills um, of different maturities. Um, I've got a bunch that just are rolling over every month. Um, I've got some three months, some six months. Uh, I put some in a one year. Let's say you're right, right? Let's say that that the bottom is, or the the, the peak in in uh, rates for the treasuries is tomorrow, and they start coming down. If you bought a bond from the, the treasury through Treasury Direct, mm -hmm. you can actually transfer that to your brokerage account and sell it in the open market, right? So you're not necessarily locked in for for no, the next it, year. No, no, it's not. It's not a function of illiquidity. That's not what we're talking about. It's it's a it's 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 complacency, right? So here's what happened, and, it, and it's, it's psychological. This is what happened in 2008. You know, at the bottom of the market in 2008, people weren't running out to buy treasuries. They were just like, I'm out, right? So it's, it's, so you get into the psychological point where I'm in treasuries, I'm getting 4%. That's all I care about. I'm good. And so the market starts to recover and go up. You know, like, I'm still getting 4%. The market's up a little bit. Don't care, right? It's fine. Market goes up some more. Okay, well, the market's gone up. So when it pulls back, I'll sell my treasuries and get into stocks while stocks keep going. Right. So you never get back in. Yeah. Exactly. And so yeah. then when your bonds finally mature, then you go, well, I don't want to buy the stock market now because look how far it's come. I've, you know, I've already missed all that move. So when it, we have our next big correction, then I'll get in. Right. But now yields on bond, treasury bonds are now back to zero to 1%. So where are you going to put your money? So the, the, the trap is going to be, people getting trapped into 4% thinking this is a good, safe yield return. And then the market takes off, yields drop, and they're kind of stuck with right. where to go to now. Yeah, you get marooned. Not, I don't want to get in the market because I'm afraid it's going to correct because it's gone up so much, but I can't go back into the treasuries because they're not yielding as oh, much yeah. anymore and I'm just stuck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's, so, so yeah, it's not about losing. You won't lose money. And if you buy bonds, yields will come down next year. Bond prices will go up. You're going to make money in your bonds. Okay, I'm not saying that at all. We're talking about the emotional, psychological narrative. And this is, I wrote an article about this not too long ago on the website, talking about how, you know, going, you know, trying to avoid a crash can be worse than actually going through the crash. Right, right. Because, and there's that old famous Peter Lynch, yeah. you know, more money has been lost waiting for the next yeah. recession than was actually lost in it. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very valid point. And I guess all I want to just tease out here for folks is I don't think you're saying, hey, don't put your money in short term treasuries. No, I think you're good. saying I think you're saying if you do, you know, be mentally prepared to cut the umbilical cord, sell it if there's some big transformative event like a big Fed pivot or something like that to avoid getting marooned. Right. And we'll be talking about this, obviously, if a big event like that happens, we'll be, you know, we'll be yeah, discussing well, it here. Yeah, yeah. Cause, in cause great detail for folks, I'm sure. Yeah, so because what's going to happen, you know, when we and I just had this conversation yesterday with one of my clients is that, you know, he's like, he's he's like, look, I, I'm 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 getting ready, you know, I'm ready for retirement, but I know that when this market bottoms, I don't want to be stuck in a 60-40 portfolio. I go, don't worry, you're not gonna be because our 60-40 portfolio will no longer be 60-40, it'll be 90-10. It'll be 90% stocks and 10% bonds, and it'll be corporates, distressed debt, that type of stuff on the 10%. The 90% will be big, large cap companies with five, six, 7% dividend yields. So, you know, you just, and so we'll be talking about here is that when we, you start seeing our portfolio expand on the equity side, that's where we're starting to fish this final bottom of the market, wherever it is. All right. Great. Great. Okay. Um, look, I got a lot of big topics to get through. And we obviously want to get to trades that you guys, uh, any trades you guys put on over the past week. Okay. Um let me let me pick up the the thread for a second on um, you know the the dark side of yields rising right which is uh, maybe a sign of growing instability. Um, the, the question I'm going to ask you is: Are we seeing signs that the central planners may be losing control of the situation? All right, because we have had some pretty interesting developments over the past couple of weeks. Um, First off, we had today's leak that you and I have mentioned a couple of times, which basically was a leak that there's now dissent 
inside the Fed, it sounds, about should they keep rate, hiking rates as aggressively as they are? Should they continue with quantitative tightening the way in which they've guided the market, right? So one of the reasons why stocks were up uh, on Friday was because, um, you know, people are beginning to say, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe the Fed's going to pause sooner than than they've been telling well, us, right? So you got that. Well, let, let me just list them and then you can, okay. you can go through. The second is... Um, Janet Yellen, former Fed chair, now runs the Treasury, issued a warning. We talked about it last week, saying that she's seeing uh, enough uh, lack of liquidity, drying up of liquidity and increase in volatility in the Treasury markets that she's now publicly sort of saying, hey, we're getting a little bit nervous about this, right? I think this was to kind of put people on notice and to put a few gears in motion that are probably going to help the system. But for her to do that, you know, it's important development. And of course, there's no bigger or more important market to the world than the U.S. Mm -hmm. Treasury market. Um, we then had uh, in the U.K., we talked about the um, the crisis there where the Bank of England had to uh, intervene. Um, but now uh, Prime Minister Liz, Liz Truss is out. She 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 didn't. She didn't last longer than the lettuce that they had. The, did you see that lettuce watch? Which is going to last longer? Yeah. Liz Truss or the head of lettuce? Um uh, and, and basically what that means is, is uh, there was a clash of policy there, right? You know, you had the Bank of England that was hiking and about to tighten. Uh, Liz Trust wanted to push through uh, a big tax relief package, which would have been stimul stimulative, right? So Bank of England putting on the brakes, she wanted to put on the gas. Uh, that created the dyspepsia that the, the markets went through, but it ultimately cost her the prime ministership, right? So this is a, a, a good example of a central planner who had a plan and it just blew up on them, right? Last, and we talked about this briefly too, uh, this morning before the Bank of Japan intervention, the yen was spiking above uh, 150, which was, uh, you know, a, a, a number we haven't, a weakness versus the dollar we haven't seen for an awfully long time. Um, and what's going on there, like you said, Lance, is is the Bank of Japan is trying to keep a cap on interest rates uh, or on, on, on bond rates. Um, and so it's basically been sacrificing the currency. And, and now the currency is getting too beat up uh, that the bank had to step in, Bank of Japan had to step in to try to just limit its meltdown. Um, what's worrisome about this, and I'll put up a chart about this, is over the past month or so, uh, Japan government bonds... Have been trading above 25 basis points for now over a month. Um, and what this is showing is that the Bank of Japan is now not succeeding on either <laughs> of what it's trying to do, right? It, it basically has to decide, do I want to sacrifice the currency or do I want to cap yields? And the problem is, is it's not being very successful at capping yields and the currency is melting down faster than it wants. So all of these are examples of things going in, in the other direction than the central planners want them to go. So I'll let you comment on any one of those that you'll like. But the big question is, is are these signs that despite all their, you know, assurances to us that they got everything under control, that things are beginning to slip through their fingers? No, and that's what I was saying is that, you know, first of all, it's not just the Fed whisperer out today that's, you know, making a note about the Fed. Mary Daly's also been um, kind of dropping some, some kind of lines that may be hinting towards, you know, kind of slowing the, taking the foot off the gas, right? right, right. And just for folks, she's the president of the San Francisco Federal Reserve. Correct. Um, and, and we may see some more of that. Now, unfortunately, the Fed's about to go into blackout because their meeting's coming up in uh, two weeks. So they're about to be in the blackout period. So we're about to stop hearing from the Fed altogether, which will probably leave some hints coming through Nick Timrose through the Wall Street Journal if there's going to be any kind of potential policy changes. Uh, I'm sure we'll get some leaks out from the Wall Street Journal kind of trying to set the market up for what the, the Fed may or may not set, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll get that. But, you know, you, you started this comment out by saying that the Feds had, you know, you know, could the Fed be losing control? I'm not sure they ever had. If, if I'm straight, right, and I'm in a car and, I'm, and my car's got good alignment on it, I can take my hands off the steering wheel and the car will keep going straight down the, the freeway, you know, for <laughs> quite a long time. And it may appear to everybody else in the world that I'm in control of the vehicle, but, you know, we're not, right? And so, you know, the question really is, is, is have they ever had control of anything at this point? And, and are they in control of anything now? And, you know, the fact that they're working on such lagging macroeconomic data 
and hiking rates as aggressively as they are, you know, the odds of them breaking something are astronomical at this point. And as we go into next year, I'm certainly we're going to probably see that happen. And I think the realization is, is that they're going to have to reverse all their policies to try to come back and fix whatever it is they broke. That's not being in control. That's just being the arsonist and the fireman, right? So you create the fire, you put it out, and you create the fire and you put it out, which is all the Fed's been doing for the last 30 years. So I'm not sure, you know, this time is any different. So, uh, so interesting you say that. So I, I am in agreement with you, um, but I had a really interesting discussion two days ago uh, on this channel, and I'm assuming you haven't had a chance to watch it, Lance, but I interviewed uh, Joseph Wang, who is a former Fed um, open markets desk trader. Yep. So, you know, when the Fed's out there basically buying assets, this guy was was part of the team doing it. And he actually understands the plumbing of how things work in our monetary system exceptionally well from the inside. And um, he is a Fed critic of, it, it, for a lot of the reasons that you and I are, but um, he definitely had a much more optimistic view of where things were headed. And a big reason for that was one, he kind of believes in, in, uh, Brent Johnson's dollar milkshake theory, where a ton of capital is going to come into the U.S. markets and, and support both the treasury market and just the, the general financial markets, you know, in general, yeah. keep things elevated. Um, but he's largely of the mindset that over the past, you know, 10 years or so, a bunch of new like sort of special funding facilities and tools and stuff like that um, have been added to the Fed toolkit. Um in ways in which he believes the Fed feels pretty confident that it's got, so my words, not his, but it's got the monetary duct tape to kind of hold things together, even if they start breaking, right? It can go in there with its magic Fed duct tape and just keep it all sure. together yeah. long enough to be able to bring inflation down. So he feels like it's not going to get forced by a financial instability event because it can put enough duct tape around it to keep everything together until inflation is low enough. And then it can say, okay, Forget about inflation. Let's now fix this stuff we broke, and let's let's surgically remove the duct tape and and begin the healing process. Um, great. I'm just curious. You haven't watched it, but I'd love to get your reaction. No, I mean it sounds great. That's what the theory was behind portfolio insurance going into 1987, too. So you know, it, it, it's you know the, the theory is always that the Fed has all these tools. You know, it's in. If you just think about this for a second, though, you know, you go back to where the market started in the 1800s, right? And I'm going to go all the way back to the 1600s. But, you know, in the U.S., the markets kind of started, you know, pre-1900. and They've been running ever since. We never needed all these financial tools and, and stuff, um, you know, to the degree we have them now. Right. We didn't need a central bank until 100 right. years ago. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, uh, again, we go back to what I was saying before. Yes, they have all these tools, right? So the Fed can go out and they can buy high yield junk bonds to keep the junk bond market from blowing up. Um, we can go out, we can buy corporate debt to keep the corporate bond market from going up. We can send capital directly to companies. We can do all these things that we've done, but is that really helping the problem, right? Are, are you solving problems or are you just creating more problems of increased levels of debt, wealth inequality, corporate inequality, uh, corporatism versus capitalism? You know, all these things that, that we talk about and everybody complains about are all can be directly linked back to all these band-aids that we've been slapping on the system for the last 10 years instead of allowing the system to go through a, a, a debt reversion and getting rid of the debt and getting and, and allowing companies to go bankrupt. And, and again, you know, this is the, the choices that we're making, which is, yeah, you know, we have financial instability. Well, the reason we have financial instability is because the shit was broken to start with, right? And all you've right. been doing is be just because we it. kept intervening. <laughs> exactly. So you got to get. So you know you got to get rid. You know, look, if you're going to cure an illness, you got to get rid of the bacteria, right? And and so we've got all these zombie companies. We've got all these other co corporations that are just is subsisting on, you know, government largesse for, from a variety of standpoints, low interest rate environments, all these type of things. Um, we wouldn't need that if you said, look, we're not going to bail you out. If you, Boeing, sorry, buddy, if, if y'all are going to spend five years buying back your own stock and have no cash in the bank and then you get into financial trouble, you're on your own. You know, all of a sudden, corporations are going to start acting differently 
about being better corporate stewards of shareholder money and corporate money than they were previously because they don't have that backstop. Everybody's just becoming dependent now on the life support system and we can't get off of it. Every time we try to get off the life support system, everything crashes. So yeah, they may have all these band-aids and buckets and everything else to bail stuff out with, but you're not making anything better. That's just the life support system. They're putting the patient back on it again. Well, really well said there, Lance. And uh, and I totally, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I agree with you. Um, I'm reluctant to discount too much of what what Joseph said. Um, he's a smart guy. Um, he's actually written books about sort of how all the monetary plumbing works. I and mean, he, he really, no, I think, has a, a much, yeah, a much don't, greater. Don't, right. But don't misunderstand what I'm saying. He's right in what he oh, says. Oh, I know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, not, I, I, but you're not fixing anything. You're not fixing the problem. No, exactly. And I said earlier, sort of about the market, there are lots of things that should happen, right? It doesn't mean right. they're going to right. in the way in which our system's being run. But the, the, the key thing I just sort of wanted to underscore, and, and folks, if you haven't watched that interview yet, I highly recommend that you do. I'll put up a link to it right here. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of people, and I think we've bandied this around on this program a fair amount of times too, Lance, which is the Fed's going to hike something until it breaks, and then it's going to be forced uh, to you know pivot because it broke something and has to prioritize fixing that over inflation. Um, not saying you know Joseph's 100% going to be proven 100% right here. I don't think he's saying that either, but um, he's basically saying probability-wise, he's not that worried. He thinks the Fed can kind of keep the whole jalopy together long enough to kill inflation. So all, all I'm trying to underscore here yeah. is, is that it's one more probability that if you are building your investing thesis around a pivot, you should definitely have some part of your, your strategy saying, okay, what if I'm wrong? What if that pivot doesn't happen on the timeline? I think it's going to. Yeah, um, that, no, was, that, was, that was one of the key things I took from that. The other, the other right, interesting thing I took from that. But, oh, go ahead. But, also to, but no, also to that point though, if your whole thesis is the world's going to come to an end and so you're you're basically invested in gold, beanie weenies, and bunkers. That's also telling you that that one-sided bet may be wrong. So you need to be hedging for that too. Exactly. Right? So if they can avoid financial instability, then the end of the world is not going to happen. Right. Right. Um, very, very good point. Um, all right. The other thing you mentioned that I, I don't want us to get into too much here, simply because um, I didn't get into it as much with Joseph as I wanted to, to really be able to, to talk super articulately about it. But he... I asked him about um, monetary uh, stimulus versus fiscal stimulus. And he basically said, yeah, I'm in Congress. So they're going to do whatever they want. And, you know, I sort of asked the question, yeah, but don't they basically need the Fed to fund Congress's fiscal stimulus? And he said, not really. He said that Congress basically has its own money printer because it can create treasury debt at will. And, you know, whenever it wants to fund something, it just needs to just, you know, create some more treasury bonds and sell them. Um, now, so obviously, yeah. So obviously, if the Fed's out of the game, you got to sell it to other people. But there are other there are other buyers right now. The question is, how long can that game go for? Right? He seemed to think that it could go for a pretty long time. I that's don't know, not, but that's, that's something that, that yeah. But that's not actually correct because the the, the Fed isn't the buyer from of the debt from the Treasury. There's only 20 dealers that buy from the Treasury. So when the Treasury goes to auction, they sell to the 20 primary dealers. If, and then that, and that's the problem we've got with the treasury market right now. And so Jan, and I'm actually writing an article following up our conversation last week. I'll have it out next week talking about this treasury illiquidity that's going on. Because the banks before for the last 12 years, the banks buy, so the treasury comes to auction, they want to auction off a billion dollars. So before the banks would buy it, they'd sit on the books for two or three days. They do what's called aging the bond and they turn around and sell it to the Fed. And the only way that the Fed can buy bonds from the Treasury is to buy it through one of the primary dealers. They credit the excess reserve account of the bank. The bank gives them the, 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 the bond goes to the Fed. The Fed credits the excess reserve account of the bank, and there's your transaction. But the Fed doesn't buy directly from the Treasury. That doesn't happen. So it, the, the problem for the Fed, the reason there's ill liquidity for the Fed is the banks are going, the Fed's not buying bonds. I don't want to buy the bonds because I don't have anybody to sell them to because nobody I'm selling to wants the bonds either. Pension funds, hedge funds, mutual funds, they don't want the bonds. So the problem for the Treasury is, is they're coming up trying to, to, to sell these bonds and there's a lack of buyers, which is why interest rates are going up because they're having to raise the interest rates to get the buyers to come in and buy the bonds. So it's not as clean and simple as that the government's got its own money printer and they can just issue debt. They can only issue debt as long as there's a buyer. And if the Fed's not buying, there's a potential problem. 
here's a potential problem. Now there are other potential big buyers out there, you know, in the in, yeah. in the past, right? I mean, other countries, you know, you just mentioned, you know, pensions, they, hedge funds, et cetera. They don't want, but they don't want to, but see, that's a problem. China well, right, again, right, right now, Janet Yellen was, months. yeah. Yeah, I just mentioned she she waved a flag about it. this is why I didn't say I didn't want to dive into it too deeply <laughs> because I, I didn't have a chance to dig into this particular topic with him. Um, but it was um, it's something that I've sort of earmarked for more exploration because I just sort of thought it was like, a, OK, no, Congress isn't going to be. I mean, again, if we have a divided Congress, they might not even agree on issuing new stimulus. But if they do. Um, you know, do they really need the Fed to play ball, or is there a fair amount they can do on their own? Joseph seemed to think the latter. Anyways, we'll 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 uh, I'll have him back on and dig more into that with him. But it was just something yeah, interesting yeah. to note. So, folks, if you watch that video, you'll you'll learn that that uh, pearl as well. Um, all right. So, um, uh, a couple topics we talk about a lot. Um, you know, probability of recession, housing layoff risk, et cetera. I want to I want to dial through that quickly. I want to use an article that you've recently written um, about recession fatigue as we do that. I think yeah. I'm going to start with housing first and then we'll get to your article. Um, so we're talking about how, how rates continue to go up. Um, mortgage rates, I mean, they're they're just causing people to bleed from the eyes these days. Um, <laughs> they're now above seven percent uh, in 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 California, they're like eight percent now. Um, you know, this is back when they were 3% or less, just what, 15, 16 months ago. I mean, the, the, the rate of change has just been unbelievable on these. As you and I have talked about, um, housing uh, is sticky. And so it takes a while to see that mortgage rate fully reflected in home prices. You and I, correct me if, you're, if I'm wrong with this assumption, but I think we believe that housing's still got a pretty miserable year or two ahead of it here. A um, uh, couple quick headlines. Um, Redfin reports that uh, the U.S. saw a record drop in home sales in September, which is the type of activity that we would expect to precede lower prices coming in the future. Um, uh, really interesting. Um, uh, there are increasing reports uh, of Airbnb bookings drying up here, which you would expect as people you know, begin to if we go into recession, people stop traveling, pull in their pocketbooks. But another big issue, too, is that I guess there's been this like massive sea change in Airbnb where um, uh, Airbnb owners are charging just exorbitant uh, cleaning fees now. And it's probably due to some wage inflation and, and you know, maybe just they're trying to see how much they can get away with. Um, but what's happening now is people are beginning to opt out of staying in Airbnbs for hotels because from a price standpoint, the hotel is not only cheaper, but you don't have to pay a cleaning fee on top of it. And, and along with these cleaning fees, oftentimes come like cleaning activities you have to do, like, you know, vacuuming the rugs or doing the dishes or doing laundry as well. Right. So people are kind of looking at the hassle and price of staying in an Airbnb and saying, ah, it's not working for me. I'm going to go back to a hotel. Of course, hotels, um, they've got a lot more overhead and they're seeing a uh, reduction in bookings. And so they're starting to lower their prices, making the hotels even more competitive with Airbnbs. And the whole reason why I'm going through this is, you know, as you and I sort of been giving a nod to in earlier conversations, there's a lot of inventory now that's owned by people as these Airbnb rentals. Well, you know, once that stock starts, once the bookings start drying up and these start becoming, uh, you know, cash that's loss, it. cash flow losses for these investors, well, they don't live in these homes. They're just going to put them on the market, right? So it's one more leg that's likely going to happen to start really pushing additional downward pressure uh, on uh, on home prices here. Um, why don't I let you comment on both those two things and I have a few more things about housing to get to? Yeah, no, I, I just think it's interesting, you know, you know, just just one thing about housing, which I think is I, I find it humorous, right? It's like, oh, seven percent mortgage rates. That's terrible, right? If you can't afford, I'm just going. If you can't afford a mortgage payment at seven percent or eight percent or nine percent, you can't afford the house. Period, right? Um, you know, the, you know, people buy payments for houses, and if I'm borrowing money for 30 years, seven percent interest, seven percent interest on a 30 year mortgage for year for decades, that was a cheap rate, right? So, you know, we've just gotten so. And again, this goes back to the Fed, right? We've gotten so spoiled now by ultra low interest rates, where you're lending money for 30 years at three and a half or 4%, or 
you know, that underperforms inflation long-term and, you know, default risk and all those other types of things. We've gotten so used and so drugged to those very low levels of rates that now we're talking about 7% rates. Like, oh my gosh, I can't afford this. You know, that tells you how dependent we are on debt. Uh, you know, a 7% rate should not make any difference to you. If you can afford to buy a house, 7%, 5%, 8% shouldn't make any difference, you know, other than your mortgage payment. But if you're going, I can't afford the house at seven, I could afford it at six, but not at seven. You really couldn't afford the house to start with. Right? <laughs> just, you know, that's, you know, because we're talking a few dollars here or there, but it's psychological, you know, Adam, that's the big thing. We talked about this before. There's two big factors that occur with mortgage rates. The first is, is that mortgage rates go up and somebody says, I can't afford the home or I don't want to pay that for a home. Right. So that's, that's one. But the other is, and, and the bigger factor for home prices and home sales is psychological. There's a lot of people out there that are going, you know what? Just a few months ago, mortgage rates were three and a half percent. I'm just going to wait because rates will come back. We've gotten so used to rates coming down and going to lower levels. Right. I wasn't in a big rush to move to start with. So I'm just going to sit in my house for another couple of years and then I'll buy. Right. And everybody's talking about the housing recession that's coming. So with everybody talking about it, everybody's just there's a psychological kind of impact to the market, so where people just go, "I'll wait," which takes even more buyers out of the market and brings prices down further. So it's kind of that self-reinforcing cycle of, of recessions. Right. Yeah. That that vicious cycle that's ahead for housing. I totally agree with you. Great. Great point. Keep going. No. The last thing is is that you know also the Airbnb thing and what's happening with housing is also rolling through in apartments. We're also seeing a fairly substantial drop in rental rates. If you take a look at, for instance, uh, the, the Zillow rent index and some other ones, you're seeing those rental rates really starting to come down now. And, and that's one of the inflation problems is that homeowners equivalent rent has not come down yet because it runs about a four to five month lag on what's happening with real rentals. And so that's going to that's going to play catch up here on the inflation side in the next few months. Yeah, that's like a CPI decline that we know is baked in the cake. It's just not showing yet and won't okay. for a couple more months, likely. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, hey, great point about about uh, the, you know, we're being so used to low rates. Uh, I interviewed uh, Dylan Grice earlier this week, and he put it great. He basically said, yeah, you know, the, the world has been addicted to zero cost capital. Yep. And that's that's the big sort of shock that's going through this year is all of a sudden capital is no longer basically free or almost free. And the world is figuring out how do we how do we exist in this new world that we haven't had to deal with for such a long time, right? right. And, and many of them took on many players took on so much debt that they can't live in a world that's not a zero cost capital world, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. And the other thing is that um, you, you talked about you know people sort of having sticker shock on interest rates, seven um, percent when you're like, hey, you know, back in the '80s, people had fifteen percent mortgages and there's no problem, right? One thing that's important to know, though, is that um, the deformation of prices caused by the intervention of bringing interest rates so low is the debt service cost, even at these the, the lower rates that we've enjoyed, yeah. is actually substantially higher than it was relative to people's income back in the 80s. And so actually, if a 15 percent or even 20 percent mortgage was more affordable back in the 80s than today's six to seven percent mortgage for people does that make sense yeah. well, we were also buying a lot smaller houses much more reasonable to live in yeah we they, were living within our means a lot more as a nation they, yeah they, they, they weren't two-story five thousand square foot houses with a pool in the backyard right you know so yeah. you know people just live normally and they bought normal houses and those type of things so yeah no there's there's a lot of factors that go into this and i think this you know going back to you know our conversation earlier this is all part and parcel of a fed byproduct as well because the Fed kept rates compressed for so long, because they didn't raise rates when they should have, because they were band-aiding over all of these other problems, it led to this huge deformation in every asset class, from real estate to bonds to stocks, which, yeah, we may be able to band-aid over all the cracks in the next financial instability, but you're still not solving your problem, right? You still have the illness of too much debt. Yep. Oh, a thousand percent. Well, so here's the interesting part of the housing conversation I want to have you, which is on Twitter, I got involved in the past like 24 hours in this debate where okay. one side of the debate says, hey, look, there's a ton of people out there who own homes who are sitting on, you know, 3% mortgages, right? And they're just going to wait this out, 
right? They don't have any need to sell. So inventory is going to dry up and these people are all going to sit. And so home prices really aren't going to come down that much, right? And my counter to that is, well, look, there's some percentage of homes that are just going to have to sell, right? People get divorced, they die, they lose their job, can't afford their home anymore. They have to move for work, whatever. You're going to have some portion of the inventory that's going to have to move. And because housing is priced at the margin, it's the sale of that inventory that's going to reprice the entire market down. I see you nodding pretty heavily as I'm saying this. Um, so it, it's really interesting. There, there are people on both sides of this that aren't given, aren't budging much from from their sides of the equation. But I'm just curious. Do you? Which, what's your perspective here? No, it, it's right. And look, it's just a function of math. And you know. So, and you're right about there's a huge bunch of people that are sitting on 3% mortgages and they're just going to stay. There's also a bunch of people sitting on 3% mortgages with a whole bunch of equity in their house that are approaching retirement and they've got no savings and they're going, they're watching that equity start to go away. And as they see that equity dropping, they're going to go, you know what, my, my whole plan has been that I'm going to retire, I'm going to downsize, and I'm going to extract that equity, pay cash from my next house and have some money in the bank, right? whatever it is. So there's a bunch of people that are going to come when they see that equity shrink enough, there's gonna be a whole bunch of inventory that comes to market because there's a lot of people in that category. When you start talking about the number of people that don't have $500 in the bank, right? 80% of Americans, they got, they, they've got a lot of, of equity tied up in that home. So you'll see inventory get drugged to market as they start seeing that equity go away because they won't, they don't know if it's coming back anytime soon. But then the other side of this to your point is, is also that you know, a lot of people are out there. And again, if I if I go into a neighborhood, right, and let's just, and this is to your point, this is the way it works. Let's say we've got a neighborhood of a thousand houses and every house in the neighborhood is priced at $500,000. And Adam goes, I'm selling and he gets $250,000 for his house. That's the comp. So anybody else that sells in that neighborhood comps to that house. And, to, and so anybody that wants to sell that thought they had a $500,000 house, they don't have a $500,000 house anymore. They've got the comp of two fifty dollars versus whatever the small differences are in their, their particular house. So to your point, you know, pricing depends, and again, exactly right, it depends on what happens on the margin, which affects everything. And, and it affects every home price across the board. And inventories are rising. They're not going down, by the way. No, they're, they're not. And that's, um, uh, you know, um, I've got some more stats here that I'll, I'll, I'll show that, that corroborate that. Um, but it's, it's so interesting to me that that's, you just explained what I see, what I think I see clearly, Lance. It seems like you do too. It's surprising to me how many people don't see that. And look, folks, I'm not saying that Lance and I, you know, well, let, let me proven a thousand percent right here, but I think this is something the average person doesn't quite get the marginal pricing of things. Okay. Well, I can give you a real life example, right? So you, 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 we talked about before I was selling my house, right? So my house was, so I listed my house at the market because there was a nut. So my house was built by Toll Brothers. So we're in this neighborhood, small gated community, 13 homes. Yeah. Well, there was all an, pretty much look the same, right? Because yeah, yeah. I'm assuming they were all built by the same developer. Yeah. All, all toll brothers. So there are variations, you know, across, you know, across the, the neighborhood was an exact model of mine. Right. So but in an ungated community, uh, about two blocks from my house was another toll brothers division ungated had the exact. So and it was actually the model home that we based our house on. So we actually replicated the model home pretty much when we built our house. And so when that, so that house went up for sale and we were already talking about selling our house. And I looked at the price of that house when it went up for sale. And I said, and, and the price that was listed. And I said, if they're selling the house for that, I'm selling mine because that house ain't worth that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now what was interesting is, is, and, and this is what happened. So I listed the price of my house way too high. And I, I go, there's no way somebody's going to pay me this much for my house. And it's just ridiculous to, to, to pay this much for this house that I'm in. And so I actually put a buffer in, uh, you know, quite a bit lower. I said, I'm willing to, and I even told my real estate agent, here's the real price I'm willing to sell for, but anything above that, great. Well, the house, the model that sold 
actually sold about $100,000 less than they listed for it because the guy was trying to get out of his house. He was actually in going in. And we didn't, nobody knew this at the time, but basically he was going into bankruptcy. So he was having to liquidate his house. So it sold for about $100,000 less. Well, that was the first sell in that entire neighborhood. And it suppressed every price in the entire neighborhood by almost $100,000. So all the, so, cause every, every house that was up for sale at that point was all comping on that one house. And when that one house sold, it changed the entire comp structure for every other house in the neighborhood. So that's how it really works in real life. And I still sold the house for way too much, but you know, it got, it didn't, I didn't get my target price. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's a great example of, of the, the criticality of the marginal buyer. And as you said, the last yeah. sale is the one that resets the, the, the comps for everybody, right? So one of the things I was saying in this Twitter debate, too, is that um, sort of like what you were saying, Lance, is um, there's a first mover advantage here as a seller, right? So what happens is, is first the sellers go on strike and they're kind of like, all right, everybody, if we just hold tight and keep prices where they are, we'll be able to protect our equity, right? But then there's somebody in there like you saying, hey, I need this to retire, right? I'm going to need to sell. And so I better go now. And yeah, maybe I shave 5%, 10% off the current market value, but at least I still retain 90 or 95% of what it currently is, right? And so somebody breaks from the herd and then all of a sudden the herd realizes that its solidarity has been broken and then everybody's rushing to sell because they don't want to be the last one in line, right? Yeah, because and then everybody's cutting prices. And so it, it just starts the price decline as everybody's going, well, I better get out now. And so they said that, you know, list me at 5% less so I can get my house sold because prices are coming down. So it becomes a race to the bottom almost at that point. To totally agree. And that's where I wanted to go with this, which is when having this discussion, a lot of people on the other side say, all right, you know what, like we'll agree to disagree, right? This really doesn't matter as long as prices aren't moving, right? Well, you know, here's an article by the New York Post that shows that home asking prices are now tumbling at a record pace as mortgage rates sur uh, surge. So um, uh, past two years, uh, the, the, the um, rate of uh, price decreases uh, in, in inventory was about two to three percent. Um, now it's at 7.9%, yeah. right? So just blowing away that what we've been seeing uh, the past couple of years, in my opinion, probably still building up steam. Yeah. But the point is, is that prices are beginning to come down in markets in, in here at a record pace so far this year. So it's no longer academic anymore. We are beginning to see these price declines coming in. Of course, as we see more, Lance, you and I will be tracking them here. All right, now I want to get to your, your recession fatigue article here. Um, uh, basically, I'm just going to reference some of the charts and data you put in here, Lance, to just kind of let you run. Um, I, I do want to just precede it all. So I'll let you define what recession fatigue is. But you say, if recession fatigue is a problem now, it's going to worsen when unemployment increases. Kind of like, hey, if you think you got it bad now, folks, like you ain't seen nothing yet. So why, why don't I hand it to you here? Yeah, so bankrate.com. Uh, so by the way, if you want a copy of the article, it's on our website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Just it's right there on the homepage. It's it's uh, just published it out on Friday. Um, so bankrate.com did a survey, and they were surveying you know different age groups and asking them you know asking them you know are you prepared for a recession and these type of things. Um, how do you feel about it? And and I thought it was really interesting because you know they're talking about how they're just you know they're just, they're just this recession has just worn them out, right? And, um, you know, a large chunk of Americans, and again, this goes back to our, what we're talking about before with the Fed, right? They are not prepared for retirement. And we're talking about large chunks of age groups, you know, 40% of, you know, millennials, these type of things have no money saved up for retirement. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting, you know, analysis because mentally, they're being worn out by a recession that we haven't officially been in yet, right? So, you know, the, we haven't had dating by the National Bureau of Economic Research that says we're in a recession. We're about to print third quarter uh, uh, GDP, which if the Atlanta Fed is even close to right, is going to be near 3% annualized. So you have a pretty big pop in, in economic growth in third quarter. And yet people feel like they're in the middle of a recession. Um, and if you think it's a, if you think, you know, high inflation and, and those type of things are weighing on you now, wait until you start, you know, like the old saying goes, 
you know, it's a, it's a recession when your neighbor loses your job, their job, but it's a depression when you lose yours. Right. You know, that's, that's what's still coming. And, and this whole great resignation thing that we've had going on, it's about to become the great termination. And that's just a function of, of time until we get there next year. And that's as these higher interest rates from the Fed begin to filter into even higher borrowing costs and even higher you know, transaction costs and credit card debt and all those things that individuals are being dependent on just to try to make ends meet now. If, if you think you're tired now of, of a recession, it's going to get worse first. Well, uh, I hate to agree with you, and you've got some great data in here. Um, what I'm going to put up a chart, um, you show the lack of emergency savings yeah. uh, that we have right now in this country, you know, 23% none, additional 28% less than three months. Um, it's only 27% that have savings that can cover six or more months of expenses. And so basically people are very vulnerable to a loss of their income uh, because they don't have anything saved up for emergencies. We then go to some quotes you have in here. Um, in America, half of the CEOs say they're considering workforce reductions during the next six months. Uh, and it's likely, this is the reporting of the CEOs, uh, they report it's likely or extremely likely that remote workers will be laid off first, um, according to a majority of, of the managers that were polled here. So, you know, already the executives of companies are saying, hey, we're going to start shedding people. And if you're a remote worker, I hate to say it, you might be first in line for this. Yeah, you may want to start showing up. If you work at home, you might want to start showing up for the office at least a couple of times a week, you know, let people know who you are. See, it's really easy to fire people you don't know. <laughs> so it's like, you know, Jim Bob, we we hired him. He's been working at home now for the last two years. Never seen his face ever. Don't even know who he is. That's a real easy guy to terminate. You know, somebody that's in the office grinding it out every day and, and showing their face. And you know, that's a much harder person to terminate because I know that person. Right. So, you know, it, it's interesting. But, yeah, that's what's coming. All right. Um, I'm going to pull up a few of the charts. But real quick, you're, you're making me think of another discussion I just had on Twitter. The last time I was in Austin, and you live in Texas, Lance, so you, yeah. you may have some insight into this. Um, last time I was there in Austin, uh, staying in a place, and I was surrounded by skyscrapers that were under construction. And yeah. one was a Google one that was almost done. One was a, a, a meta Facebook one that was like still halfway under construction. Um, clearly massive investments by both these companies. But... Um, you know, they they both have hiring freezes in place and Meta, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment, uh, is already planning to lay off like a pretty substantial number of its employees here. So, you know, um, you know, you, you're going to have these companies that are sitting on all this overhead that they're probably not even going to be using anyways, <laughs> uh, which I think is just going to put downward pressure on their profitability and force them to have to lay off even more workers, I imagine. Well, you know, you always see this. I remember back going into, so this was 2007 ish. And in Houston at that time, you know, we were just having a massive building boom of, of, of buildings and everything else. And one of the key kind of the key moments was, is there's this engineering company. I'll, I'll, I won't tell you the name of the company, but they're no longer around. Um, but there was this engineering company and they were leasing office space. And they've been leasing this one office building for like 30 years. They've been in this one office building and just had been running their whole company out of it. And this is 2007. Everything's ginning on all, you know, all cylinders. And they go out and build two massive buildings just for their company, right? And, and make that massive investment. And then a year later, it's all over, right? They're out of business. Business is gone buildings are up for sale. So whenever you see, you know, there's the old high rise indicator we talked about before, like when people right. build a bunch of high rises, it's typically kind of that peak exuberance. And remember, if I'm going to build a high rise, I don't just wake up tomorrow morning and Adam and I are going to build a high rise and we start construction, right? This takes months or years to find the, to find the land, to do the architectural work, to do the engineering work, you know, start getting all the materials together, start the construction process, Getting so the permits. Yeah. 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 All, all that. So, I mean, they started these projects two years ago when everything was booming, right? And all of a sudden now you've come full circle and, and all that's going away. And now they're having to talk about, uh, you know, laying people off. So, what will happen is, as is always the case, you know, they'll probably occupy a much smaller portion of this building and at least out the rest of the building to, you know, hopefully other companies that can come in and lease some space. Already in Houston, in particular, 
we've got way too much commercial office space. And if you take a look at the amount of empty square footage that we have nationally, um, we talked about this before, one of the worst investments probably over the next year is going to be investing in commercial real estate because there's just yeah. too much of a supply. Yeah, no, great context, Lance. Um, I, you know, I, I, I wish we weren't going to be seeing this, but it seems like we're going to. And I want to put up another chart you show here, which is showing that consumers are increasingly failing uh, to make ends meet. And this has actually been a long trend um, where, uh, you know, basically uh, people have been, cost of living has been rising so much and, and real wages uh, have been stagnating so much that the, the resulting gap that opens up has just been widening and widening um, as the decades have been going on since the mid 90s. Uh, and you can see right here at the very end, there was a little brief reprieve when people got the stimulus checks and the moratoria and the tax breaks, et cetera, from, from the pandemic. But it has since uh, evaporated and we're now down at, at the biggest gap we've actually yet seen. Um, and and when you look at this chart, everything that's below the, the zero line basically is where um, you know, the consumer is having to fund their lifestyle uh, at a deficit. So yeah. largely taking on debt, oftentimes, you know, most in most cases, revolving credit uh, that tends to have a much higher um, interest rate on it. So you can just see here, uh, it, 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 <laughs> the trend is bad, the absolute values are bad, uh, and it just doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon. It looks like it's probably just going to continue getting worse. I'm going to follow it up with this chart, which shows um, what's happened recently with consumer debt balances. And you can see uh, coming into Q1 uh, that folks were able to pay off uh, their debt a little bit um, with the funds that they were getting, but that's all gone. And we're now back up to a record level here. And the interest rates on all of this debt are going up, right? Yeah, so not only are they taking on more debt, but the debt is costing them more. And we're seeing very quickly in the last couple of, uh, of months here, um, you know, it's increasing at a faster, it's a bigger pile increasing at a faster rate, which we all know how that ends, which is badly. Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, we talk about the criminal enterprises called banks and, uh, you know, what's really interesting right now is I just got a call from a, a, a very nice uh, person yesterday and he's like, you know, I'm, I'm at this one bank. I won't mention it, but they're a really big bank. They're part of the criminal enterprise mafia. Mm -hmm. um, and like, you know, it's like, I've, I've got all this money sitting and this is the cash we use to run our business. And we're getting 80 basis points <laughs> from a money market account. He's like, I don't, I, he says, I, I don't understand this, right? Because I'm getting 80 basis points, but the bank just reported earnings and marked record net income, net interest income because of the spread between what they're paying out of money markets and what they're getting from excess reserves, right? right. And so there's this massive spread. And so they're keeping all this money. But so, so here's, here's what is really sad about all this. At the same time that they're keeping all the money that the Fed's giving them because of these high interest rates and not passing it through to savers in terms of higher money market rates, which should be north of 2% at least, because if you go to Fidelity right now and put your money in a money market account, you can get 2%. So there you go. Fed, you know, This bank's paying 80 basis points. That tells you what's happening there. But at the same time, though, they're jacking up the rates on the credit cards because as the, as the, the Fed hikes interest rates, that drives all those very worries. So they're more than happy to charge you more on your credit cards, but they're not willing to share the interest rate on your savings. Oh, right? it's the worst thing ever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When when you give us money, you know, we'll give you next to nothing on it. When we give you money, how about you pay us eighteen to twenty percent exactly. on your credit card? Right? Exactly. It's and, and this, and this, and but now, again, now we go back to the Fed, and and again, oh yeah, you're patching everything up just right. All you've done is make the criminal enterprise mafia group banks even stronger than they were before. So I want to throw that, that and you weaken the, the inequality. Fed to, the Fed is about to become the mob boss if they don't stop. <laughs> I think a lot of people would challenge that and say the Fed already is the mob boss, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Maybe. But, 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 but to your point, not only do they get all the advantage, but it it, it, it weakens the populace, right? And in your yeah. report ends with the sad punchline that 60% of Americans say that they're living paycheck to paycheck. And I've seen those studies, like a good chunk of people that are making six figures annually are living paycheck to paycheck. And it's interesting too, there's an actual quote in there from Harvard Business Review, and, and they make this statement that, you know, uh, and we hear this a lot, right? The household balance sheet is so strong because 
you know, there's excess savings. Every everybody has. I, I've never had excess savings in my life. I've never had so much in savings. I went, you know what? I just I'm going to go burn some cash because <laughs> I just have too much in savings. Never happened anyway. But they say that that every quintile of home ownership now or, or households have these higher levels of savings. It's absolutely fundamentally not true because if it was, you would. If I've got savings, why on earth would I run up my credit card? Right. Right. Especially have, at today's rates. Right. And if I have excess savings, then why is it that go back to all that, you know, above uh, in, in that report, why is it that you've got 30, 40, 50 percent of households unprepared for a recession, three, less than three months worth of, of savings saved up to meet an emergency? You know, why are they in record credit card debt? Why? You know, none of that makes sense. Yes, there is a bunch of cash out there and it's all held by the top 10% of income earners, which is why they own 90% of the stock market. Right, right. And this is the important, we've talked about this before, the difference, the important difference between the mean and the median. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. All right. Well, look, um, so as you talked about, hey, look, if you don't like how things are right now, you're going to you're gonna really like, not, not like how things are going to be likely, you know, in a year if, if we truly are like really in the depths of a recession by then. Real quick, I just wanted to dial through right before we hopped on here. I did a quick Google search for layoffs. Here's what came up. And these are recently announced layoffs. Microsoft laying off uh, at least a thousand workers. Uh, Twitter, and this is a little bit over dramatized per perhaps, but um, it's now being rumored that Elon Musk is planning on laying off 75% of Twitter's workforce, right? Which I think, well, anyways, crazy amount. Um, that that actually raises a question I'll get to in just a second. Facebook has announced it's going to lay off 15% uh, of its staff. Uh, that uh, equates to about 12,000 workers. Um, Clear Capital, a financial company, uh, just laid off 27% of their staff. There's a lot more there, but I just wanted to sort of show that, A, these are really big companies. We're, we're up in the FANG groups now, right? The, the, the bulletproof, the com com companies that were once bulletproof. And it's not just all tech. That's why I threw Clear Capital in there. There's a bunch of other industries that are going through this as well. So it's just, you can't just dismiss it as, oh, well, that's just in one part of the economy. It's pretty, pretty wide base at this point in time. So A, um, just like I said, with housing, that we're actually are beginning to see the price declines be with with jobs. It's beginning to get real. And we're really beginning to see some serious volume at serious companies. The other question, too, I just wanted to kind of toss out there for you. Like, I almost I mean, I, if let's assume that Elon Musk cuts 75 percent of Twitter staff, I'm pretty sure Twitter can still run. Right. Yeah. Maybe they might not roll out as many features as quickly or whatnot. But um where, where I kind of want to go with this is to a certain extent, there are a lot of what are called, pardon my French, bullshit jobs in today's yeah. economy uh, that, you know, in a recession, you really find out who, who's got a bullshit job and who has an essential job, right? And a lot of us like to think that we're completely essential. But, you know, when when the chips are down, you know, maybe maybe 100% of your responsibilities become 30% of somebody else's responsibilities who remains with the company after they let you go. Well, this is all. This is always the big joke, right? Which is every time we go through these debt, you know, kind of these these government shutdowns because of some you know debate over the budget or whatever it is, and so we're oh, we're shut down the government. So the first thing they do is they lay off non-essential workers, which is like nine hundred thousand government workers, right? So they furlough those guys. They're still getting paid, by the way. <laughs> but if you're non-essential, why are you there to start with? Right. right? <laughs> Thanks for the question. We, we can take 900,000 people off of government roles and just save a bunch of money. That would be, you know, obviously, if you're classified as non-essential, you're not really essential to running the government. But no, it, you're right. You know, during, during you, know, uh, you know, growth phases in companies, you know, they just hire people. Um, you know, uh, Meta, Google, uh, Google made this statement, you know, recently, you know, they're going to cut back on our hiring and you know, they, they kind of just set their groups up. They go, y'all just hire whoever you want and just, you know, get them in and get them working. And so they just, they're just on this mill of just, you know, hiring people constantly. Well, right. when you're not worried about profitability, yeah. that's the mindset. I've seen it yeah. when I used to work in Silicon Valley. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. And then when you get, when the rubber hits the road, it's like all of a sudden it's like, yeah, uh, we got a lot of people not doing anything around here. So time to go. And, and that's that's coming, you know. That's just a function of time until we get there. And then then you're going to go through. So you go hiring freezes, then you do layoffs, terminations, back to hiring freezes, 
once you get lean and mean, you don't hire anybody back. And then once the economy starts to recover, then you start, you know, bringing people back on staff. But, but the, this is the, just the cycle of, of employment. And this is why if you look at a chart of unemployment, it does this spike straight up, comes down, <laughs> spike straight up, comes down. You know? So, so totally agree and get it. One of the questions, I'm having this conversation for two reasons. One, it's people should ask themselves, look, how vulnerable am I, yeah. right? Are you and essential? Think, how essential am I, right? Because yeah. given what you and I see coming, there may be a lot of companies that are really going to intentionally cut to the bone, right? Like, let's yeah. let's get rid of everything we can, right? But what I also wonder is, is unlike past generations where when you've had like a massive asset bubble bursting that lingers in the national consciousness and, and it changes behavior permanently, and it generally takes a generation or two before you make the same mistake because you, you have to let everybody who remembers it die off. Our generation has been through three massive big bubbles in the past 22 years, right? Yep. Dot com, housing, and, and now the everything bubble. And I think the mentality is, is okay, well, we just boom, bust, boom, bust. And, and, and when we when we come out of this next bust, it's going to be boom again. And everyone's going to be, you know, throwing money at everything again. It may not. This one might be might be painful enough where real change happens, both psychologically, but also maybe with, you know, regulations or corporate policy or whatever. And we might not slingshot back quickly from this, um, both for the reasons I just mentioned, but also. Um, there's still automation that's going on here. It's still ex really expensive to hire real people. Companies are going to use this downturn to continue to lean into automation so that they, they don't need to hire as many people back. We also have the whole friend shoring thing that's going on, um, which sure, manufacturing that we're just moving a body from one Asian country, maybe to a Latin American country, right? Um, it's but I, th I think that's also going to suck a lot of virtual jobs along with it. And to your point earlier, you might, you might, you know, you might still be able to be a virtual worker, but just remember when you're a virtual worker, you're not competing with the American virtual workforce. You're now competing with the global virtual resource. And a lot of this French shoring may pull more than just manufacturing jobs along with it too, right? So the thing I'm just trying to underscore is, is, is A, you know, don't get caught by, so I don't want anyone to get caught by surprise uh, if their job is more vulnerable than, than they'd like. But B, I don't want, people to have maybe a, a, a naive assumption that, okay, well, my job's going to come back. In certain cases, those jobs may never come back for the reasons I just mentioned. Well, no. And look, if you just take a look at the, the employment reports, I always find it fascinating, right? So we report 233,000 jobs, you know, last month or whatever, right? Where are those jobs created? Are those technology jobs, you know, high-end, high-earning technology jobs, you know, oil and gas manufacturing jobs, manufacturing jobs in general? You know, what are the bulk of the jobs? You create? Yes, some of those jobs are being created and, and those are getting hired. But, you know, you take a look at those reports and by and large, you know, the biggest chunk of those hirings every time are leisure, hospitality, retail. Yeah, workers. there's service you know, industry, low level service industry jobs in those industries. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, it's, and it's the lowest wage paying job. Unskilled. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's where, you know, and, and so you've got to really you know, look at the dynamic of the country over the course of the last 30 years. We're not heading in the direction that creates better economic prosperity. You know, the more debt, the more, you know, deficits that we continue to run, the more downward pressure on economic growth that you create, which keeps driving everybody to the lowest common denominator. So, you know, we're, we're slowly migrating back in the 60s and 70s. And again, you go back to that chart that was in my report that showed you know, back in the 60s and 70s, even the early 80s, you know, those, you know, individuals between their income and their savings were able to support their standard of living and, and have excess, right? And then we get into the 90s, and all of a sudden, income and wages alone aren't able to, uh, sorry, income and savings alone aren't able to support the standard of living, and we're having to go further and further and further into debt, and as we do that, we keep dragging everybody to the lowest common denominator. Now, you know, this whole kind of political shift we did post-2008 towards more socialistic attitudes about economic activity is even making, is even creating a faster uh, pathway to driving everything to the lowest common denominator in terms, in terms of standard of living and earnings. And, and this isn't the way that we should be wanting to head. But again, I keep going back to the Fed. This is all a function of what the Fed has done. Yes, they can band-aid stuff over, but they're not creating the economic structure 
to supply and to create higher rates of organic economic growth that lead to better economic prosperity and higher rates of sustainable inflation, which is what you want. That's the magic, that's the magic combination. If I could have 4% inflation, 5% economic growth, and a, and a 6 or 7% savings rate, that's economic nirvana. You know, but we're hoping to get above 2%. 2% prior to 1990 on economic growth was considered pre-recessionary. Right. <laughs> And now we're just hoping to get there. Get there, you know? yeah. And that just tells you, you know, really what we've done economically, you know, politically, economically, you know, just and, and really, unfortunately, financially for the for the country, we just not push people in the right direction. Well, totally agree. And again, you're putting your finger on the main reason why we created wealthy on the first place, which is, hey, if this is the world we're living in, how do we as individuals not become victims of of the trend and try to bucket and actually increase our own personal prosperity at the rate that we want. Um, on that vein, let's talk about trades. What trades did you guys make over the past week? Uh, so um, Tuesday and Wednesday, and again, if you go to our website, shameless plug, uh, subscribe to our newsletter. There's a link around the front page. You subscribe to the newsletter. We list all of our trades at the bottom of the newsletter every week. Um, but we bought a little bit of Comcast. So we've got some tax law sales that are coming up. Um, one of our tax law sales, we're just kind of waiting for the right opportunity is, is we've got a position in Verizon. We like the company very much fundamentally. Um, has a 7% dividend yield. Um, you know, it's a very small position in our portfolio. We're going we're gonna to take the tax law sell on that at some point. We're going to buy it back eventually because, again, as we get into next year, uh, deep discount, value-oriented, high dividend yield companies are where you're going to want to be. So we were a little bit early on that trade. So we're going to take the tax loss sell on that. But we bought Comcast, which is almost a mirror image of, of Verizon to a degree. Yep. Um, and a good way to avoid the wash sale, which you and I talked exactly, about the other, the other week. Yep. Exactly. And, you know, and here's, and both these companies trade at sub 10 Ford PEs. They, you know, got uh, decent, you know, nice dividend yields to them, almost 4% on Comcast. So, you know, those, those are the kind of type of companies that, you know, if the market falls apart next year, they, they've already been beaten up enough that they're not going to go down a whole lot more. So um, we picked up a little bit of Comcast uh, for that reason. And we also, because of what's happening with the net interest income, uh, we also, we had no financial exposure whatsoever. Uh, so we added a little bit of a, a small position to Goldman Sachs in our portfolio because, you know, we just need to get in bed with a vampire squid. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm curious, just, you know, wh why a bank like that? Uh, the, only, the only reason we, we were debating between, so, so again, it goes a little bit back to passive investing as well, which is, you know, all the passive flows. If you look at the top 10 stocks in XLF, which is the Spider Financial Sector ETF, it's J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. Okay, there you go. So you're just practicing what you've been preaching. Yeah, exactly. But the, the, so we were debating between an actual bank, J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. The only reason, and, and we may have made the wrong choice, we'll wait and see. But the one thing that Goldman Sachs is doing right now is they're reorging their whole kind of business. And they went in, you know, so after 2000, so in 2008, you know, if you wanted a bailout from the government, you had to be a bank. So GE became a bank, Goldman Sachs became a bank so they could get bailed out by the government. And so they had this banking charter and they had to do something with it. It was a miserable failure. Um, they tried this whole thing called Marcus and some other stuff. And, you know, it's just, that's not their, their bailiwick is not being a bank. Their bailiwick is doing investment banking and, and being kind of that white glove, high net worth, you know, kind of brokerage firm. So our, our thought process was, is that we're going to probably have credit card defaults and, you know, rising default rates on, you know, mortgages and houses and cars and all kinds of stuff, which will impact a, comp a bank like JP Morgan, potentially more than Goldman more, Sachs, yep. which, you know, is going to, and they're reorging and Goldman Sachs is reorging their business to really concentrate now back on their investment banking business, which is where they, and trading which is where they really make their money. Right, and which is their the competitive Fed, advantage. Right. And if the Fed comes in and starts doing QE and all that again, then that trading revenue is going to skyrocket. So just so we bought a, a kind of a small theater position to start building a position in Goldman Sachs. Okay. All right. Well, look, we're uh, at about the hour and a half mark. So I got to start winding it down. Um, I do want to end on something positive. And this is sort of near and dear to your and my, uh, my hearts, Lance. We've talked about it in the past. 
Um, uh, but uh, I got invited to go just down and speak with a local high school uh, to their financial literacy group. Um, I was so excited that they actually nice. had one. <laughs> and uh, it was funny is one of the one of the kids down there it was a Friday night and he was just on YouTube and he he came across, I guess he was researching I-bonds and then lo and behold, the video of me popped up there. And he's like, I think I've seen that guy around town. So he reached out, invited me to come talk to the group. Um, it's really funny because uh, the it, it was basically the first meeting of the group. So you and I have been talking a lot about, hey, what's the wisdom that we would pass along to younger younger people just starting out? And lo and behold, this opportunity fell right in my lap. And what was interesting is is they 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 were they were so early in the process that they didn't even know what they wanted to learn yet at this point, and and that was a real sort of sanity check with me. It was like, okay, wow, that's right. Like, I need to just start from like literally chapter one with these guys, and we probably got through. You know, if I'm using a book analogy, we probably got through the forward of the book before <laughs> we even <laughs> could get to chapter one before our our time together was was out. But um, for those of us that are talking about sort of being mentors either to our own children or to the next generation or whatnot, um, really important to really understand from the get-go, um, you know, where people are starting from. And in most cases, they're actually starting from ground zero. So you really just got to start with the absolute basics, like, it, it, you know, very quickly kind of realized, oh, they're, you know, they don't even really know what a stock is or a bond is or whatever. And, and, and basically I said, look, let, let's forget about the investing part for a moment. And this is what I want you to comment on, Lance, which is I told them, you know what, at your stage in life, you're much better like developing your earnings muscles and your savings muscles right now. The investing ones can come later, right? Um, but it's really important to develop the lifelong habits of first learning how you can create value that you can then get paid for, right? And then taking what you get paid and not spending it, right? Yep. Saving it and let it begin to accrete. I'm, I see you sort of just nodding here, but it was like a big light bulb going off in these kids' heads because they were so excited initially to talk about like, oh, what's the thing I should buy that's going to make me the most money? Uh, and I basically said, look, let, let's not worry about that yet. Let's worry about the first two. And we talked about how most private wealth usually comes from private business that people start, right? Not right. That doesn't necessarily come from, from trading the markets. Um, the other thing I told them was, um, you know, a couple of kids were like, oh, I've got a couple hundred bucks or I've got a thousand bucks my grandmother gave me or whatever. You know, what should I put it in to make the most money over the next year? And I told them, I said, you know, you, you shouldn't really be thinking about that right now. What you should be doing instead is learning how investing works and developing the right habits. So don't don't just put that whole thousand dollars in an I bond, which honestly, probably the best risk return I could tell you to do right now. If I was just trying to give you the best risk adjusted return for the next year. Instead, you should diversify. You should break that up a couple of, across a couple of different asset classes. You should see how they worked. I used your car analogy, right, about driving the car, learning how it works before you you try to assemble it part by part, right? So encourage them, you know, don't don't try to pick a stock yet. Just pick the major indices, see what drives them, watch the news, kind of learn the heartbeat of how the market works. So, anyways, I'll pause here. You've been nodding through a lot of this, but I, I'm I'm just curious. Would you have, would you have you know added anything else to that conversation? No, I, you know the 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 biggest. So this you know what you ran into is the biggest challenge, and this is the one thing that really burns me up more than anything else. Because I get calls all the time from teachers, and they're like, "Hey, we're having an investing class. Would you come in and talk to the students about how to invest in stocks?" And I'm like, "No, I won't do it." And they're like, "Well, why not?" So because you're not teaching them to invest, you're teaching them to gamble. And because I, you know, I said, said you're going to have a competition that at the end of the, the end of the semester, whoever makes the most money in the portfolio wins, you know, whatever, right? And he's like, well, yeah, and that's how the that's how the program works in this package I got from wherever it came from. You know, I said you're not teaching anything; you're teaching them to gamble, right? They're going to go. You know, I can teach them to come in and buy you know penny stocks and how to make money on that. Right. Whoever but makes the, the, the most reckless but luckiest move wins, right? Exactly. That's not, that's not teaching them anything. So what do we want to teach them? And you hit the nail on the head, which is, you know, the hardest lesson, and I, and I am still working with my kids on this lesson, which is when you earn a dollar, save 30 cents of it and put it in the, you know, you can spend the other 70, but 30 cents goes into the bank. And you've got to get to that habit that you're saving 30% of what you make. And if you can save 30% of what you make and then, you know, invest it, 
you're, you're golden, right? But, you know, again, if you talk to most people, you go back to that report we were talking about earlier on recession fatigue, go talk to those people and say, save, you need to start saving 30% of your income. They can't. And, and, and their lifestyle far exceeds what they've got coming in in wages. And, and so we get all pissed off, right? This is the one thing I always find kind of humorous with people. You know, they, they get all pissed off because they're not making enough money. They're not, their job doesn't pay them, you know, what they feel like they're worth. You know, and, and so, but then they've got all this debt. They've got all these other bills to pay, and it's not fair. And the world's just not fair, and it needs to be different. It's all your problem. It's not anybody else's problem, but yours. And you know, if you want a better job and get more money, go get an education. Of some, I just sent my kids a list of ten jobs that pay more than one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and a year, right? Starting salaries. And because, you know, they're both in the first years of college. So I'm sending them all this information. I'm like, hey, I ran across and I'm, I'm purposely seeking this stuff out. Right. But I just, oh, I ran across this today. Here's 10 jobs that, you know, pay the most coming out of college, six figure jobs, because I'm trying to guide them in a, in a manner, select a degree of something that somebody wants to pay you for something. It's got to be a degree that somebody finds value in. Just because you went to college and got a degree in pick whatever, sociology, psychology, you know, whatever, and you go out and somebody's not willing to pay you $100,000 a year, it's because they find no value in that, whatever that degree, I'm not saying sociology, I'm just threw out degrees, right? Don't, don't yeah. see me on this. It's called under, underwater basket weaving. Yeah, whatever, right? So you get that degree and somebody doesn't find value in that. You know, they'll say, well, I'll pay you $50,000 a year for that job, but I want 100. Well, it's not worth 100. It's worth 50, right? So if, you know, don't complain about that. That was a choice you made. Go back and get a different degree, right? Do something different. Work harder than everybody else in your office and, and make yourself so valuable that the company has to pay you more to, to keep that job. You know, a good example of this is my wife uh, works for a company at, uh, that's literally upstairs from my office. And she has a really, really big customer. And the head of the, the she, so they had to fly out to Florida this week. They were, they were doing a bunkering there. And the customer said, your company's paying you well for this, aren't they? And she's like, yeah, they, they pay me well for my job. And he's like, well, if you feel like ever they're not paying you enough, call me. Because she has value and she has a, she, and she doesn't have a degree in it. But she worked her way into this position. She worked hard. She developed a skill set. And she worked her way into a position to where now she's an invaluable component of this company. They don't have a choice. If they lose her, they lose all their customers because they'll, the customers will follow her wherever she goes, right? But this is the point I try to make across to my kids is don't complain about society and the evil and you're not being paid enough. You are paid what you're worth. Either you create value for yourself or you're going to have a problem. And if you're not say if you're spending everything you make trying to drive a BMW or Mercedes and buying a $500,000 house and trying to buy Gucci bags and, and, and uh, Jimmy Choo shoes, whatever, and you're spending everything you have on, on a lifestyle and not saving any money, that's not anybody else's fault but yours. And that's the one thing I don't think we teach well enough is that the decisions we make have consequences and it's nobody's job to bail you out of bad decisions. We've got to start teaching people to make better decisions early on in life. And that's why I struggle so much trying to teach my kids how to save 30% of their money, right? And if you can save that, it solves a whole lot of problems. Well, yeah. And, and so I started with these kids recommending a couple of resources to them, one of which was the millionaire next door, because that does a great job empirically showing you that the number one factor that people who are successful wealth builders have is frugality, right? It's the ability to turn a dollar of income into as close to a dollar of savings as they possibly can, right? The other thing I, I, I told them, which I think comports well with what you said is, um, especially at their age, um, you know, like my daughter is out there working jobs and she's always stressing about like, oh, well, I could work here because they pay an extra dollar an hour. And I keep telling her, don't worry about that. In fact, right now, I don't even think you should necessarily be working for money. Like, yeah, okay, get a job to make some spending money. But what you should be doing instead is asking, where can I get the best experience? And for those people, you should knock on their door and say, hey, I'm really interested in what you do. 
how about this? I work for you for free for a month. Let's just see how it goes. You get free labor from me. And at the end of the month, if I'm actually making a difference here, then we can talk about what you're going to pay me, right? And even if even if they agree on a, a, a payment that, that you're unhappy with at that point in time, well, now you've got marketable experience that you can take to one of their competitors and say, I've been doing this for the past month or yeah. two. I'll do it for you. Let's talk about a wage, right? So, you know, it's all about we're talking about here, it's all about the process of learning how to create value. And and why I, I sort of save this for the end of this conversation is, yes, it's great that we're we're trying to encourage, you know, younger generations to, to think of all this stuff. But a lot of what we just talked about, right, focusing on the earnings and the savings muscles, that's relevant to adults in general, but I think it's particularly relevant to them going, in, you know, in a bear market, in a recession, where you might not earn as much as you hope. You might even lose your job for a time, right? Or the investing side might go to sleep for a while, right? Because the average returns of the market may not be very good for the next six months or eight months or whatnot, right? So you're, you know, you're better off just saying, okay, great. How do I improve my earning situation and my saving situation? And then either when I'm in a position of, of greater strength or the market's in a position of greater strength, then the investing part can become important again. That's right. Uh, that's absolutely right. But again, this is, you know, you know, these are the things that we used to teach people, you know, back in the 60s and 70s when I was growing up. This is, you know, this is what we were taught. Right. And you were, you know, I was taught never have a credit card, never, you know, always save your money, you know, these type of things. But, you know, we just don't we just don't teach that anymore. Uh, at all. Not, no, do we not teach it? But like when you go to college, what's the very first thing that's awaiting you when you open your mailbox for the first yeah. time? It's credit the card. credit card offers, right? <laughs> like we market the opposite to you. Yeah. And, and again, it's just, you know, this is, but again, we've just, you know, we have a whole society and look, and this is the, look, I hate social media, but this is, you know, a social media problem, right? You know, my kids are inundated every day with social media ads, right? And, you know, Snap just reported their earnings, missed, missed uh, you know, missed earnings because ad revenue is dropping. Thank goodness. But, uh, you know, but every day my kids are being either, you know, hit by ads about buy this or buy this or buy this other thing, or, you know, the people that they follow, you know, are driving big expensive cars, right. living in houses, and showing off what new clothes they have, or whatever. Right. And so they have this very distorted view that everybody lives that way. And it's just not the case. And, and this is why, again, you know, my kids hated me growing up because, you know, when they were 16, they they had to get jobs and work. At least they understand the concept of work and money. And, and now that they're in school, they're starting to, to realize that, you know, what is, you know, on social media isn't what's in real life. And there's, there's a big difference between being on your own, having to pay your own bills, your own rent, put your gas in your car, you know, and, and working minimum wage jobs to, to accomplish this while you're in school, you know, is, is a much more realistic lesson than most get. Well, and it's it's a gift you're having them learn that lesson at 16, 17, 18 versus 26, 27, 28. It makes a very big difference in, in the outcome of their life. All right. Well, look, we're going to start wrapping things up here. But um, uh, to end on a, on a positive note here, um, if we had more time. Um, I, I was going to tell you about this kid I met when I was at the New Orleans conference. Um, his name is Devin Woolwind. And um, this kid is 15. Uh, he owns 41 properties at this point. Wow. He bought his first one when he was seven. He wrote a book about the process when he was 11. Um, a total inspiration sort of from a parent's point of view yeah. in terms of teach the kid the right way about money and to see what they can do. You know, Already at his young age, he's way better than a lot of adults, but imagine what his real estate portfolio is going to look like when he's 30, 50, yeah. et cetera. Right? It's going to be amazing. Um, if folks find that story inspiring at all, I'm thinking about interviewing him for Wealthion. So if that's something you'd be interested in, um, yeah. you know, just real estate in general, but also learning how to get your kids involved early on in their lives into the, the science and the art of real estate investing, let me know in the comments section below. Um, and as we wrap up here, I'll let you folks know too, I'm, I've got a treat for you coming up in just a minute. So stick around. When I was in New Orleans, I got to go to a private showing by the Preservation Hall jazz band down there in New Orleans. It was great. Uh, you'll see what I mean in just a minute. Uh, super fun being in that room too, Lance, because you know I'm listening to these guys along with 
Rick Rule and Brent Johnson and George Gammon and, you know, all the folks that were down there. We were all literally hanging out together, just enjoying the wonderful New Orleans jazz. But uh, I've got a snippet of that concert for you guys that I'll share. Just in wrapping up really quickly, I think Lance and I have done probably, you know, we've probably beaten the horse uh, to a, a bloody pulp at this point about what challenging markets the, uh, these are. And, you know, in my opinion, very few people have the experience um, skill set and constitution to navigate them on their own. So again, highly recommend you work with a professional financial advisor that understands all the macro issues and risks that Lance and I have been talking about here. If you've got a good one, great, stick with them. But if not, if you want um, a free consultation um, or just a second opinion from one who does, uh, maybe even Lance and his team at, at RIA themselves, uh, just go to Wealthion.com. It only takes you a couple of seconds. We can set up an appointment with them doesn't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with them. It's just a public service they offer to help people. Um, so definitely go do that. And also, um, if you enjoy these uh, weekly market recaps between Lance and I, even though we spend all our time trying to keep them brief and we basically exceed our uh, record yeah. limits uh, week after week after week, like I think we're doing here, do me a favor and hit the like button to support this channel, as well as click on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Lance, thanks so much for joining me again. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching and enjoy the Preservation Hall Jazz Band.